committee will come to order. We are not here today to debate the existence of global warming. There will be no dueling charts and graphs. <laughs> there will be no recitation of scientific arguments that point first one way, then the other, like a weather vane <laughs> gone wild. <laughs> the time for that is over. That debate is done. The question now is, what are we going to do about the global warming crisis in a concrete, far-reaching way, in a way that will create a truly livable world for my 17 grandchildren and for all others? So today I have an announcement. On May 23rd, I will bring serious, substantive legislation before our committee to reinvigorate international negotiations to stop global warming and to help developing nations produce energy in a clean and sustainable way. With passage of the bill, this committee and this Congress will send a strong bipartisan signal that the time for endless delays to stem global warming is past. Task number one is to overhaul dramatically the manner in which this administration and the administration that follows it negotiates with our global partners on climate change. Like the last remaining fan at a sporting event whose team is losing badly, this administration has stubbornly sat on its hands and refused to acknowledge the score. It has dispatched low-level negotiators to international climate meetings, armed with simple marching orders, deny, stall, and postpone. Just the other day, the Washington Post revealed that the administration is trying to soften tough climate change language to be declared at next month's G8 meeting. Under my legislation, cabinet-level officials will board planes to represent the United States at critical climate change negotiations. Instead of turning their backs on the United Nations, our diplomats will negotiate intensively within the global framework. And if the White House heeds the call of my bill, our diplomats will have a bold new mission to negotiate a post-Kyoto framework that contains binding commitments for environmental action from all of the world's polluters, including China and India. As my legislation makes clear, any meaningful post-Kyoto agreement must have three key elements. A viable target for stabilizing carbon dioxide concentration in the Earth's atmosphere binding emissions reduction targets, and flexible mechanisms such as carbon trading to make the agreement economically workable. But given the potentially catastrophic uh, humanitarian consequences of global warming, we can't wait for the years it will take for such an agreement to be done before we roll up our sleeves and start working. That is why my bill allocates more money to the U.S. Agency for International Development to work with developing nations to improve energy efficiency and to bolster the regulatory and financial environments for adopting clean energy technologies. That is why my legislation contains new initiatives to boost American exports of energy efficient and clean energy technologies a sector of our economy on the cutting edge of technological innovation. And that is why I propose the establishment of an international clean energy foundation, a semi-autonomous institution that would leverage the resources that NGOs, private companies, foreign governments can bring to bear. The foundation will support the most creative and feasible models for implementing renewable energy sources and other energy alternatives. The good news is that because of the hard work of scientists, innovators, and entrepreneurs around the globe, 
the technology we need to stem global warming is available and is affordable. But to summon the national and global political will to tackle climate change, we need to adopt collectively a new mindset about our planet, an urgent, proactive mindset. Speaker Nancy Pelosi, to her enormous credit, has challenged all committees to submit legislation by June. We in our committee will fill this most important mandate, and Congress will at long last approve far-reaching legislation to revive American leadership worldwide in efforts to curb global warming and to preserve our planet for future generations. I now invite my dear friend and distinguished colleague, the ranking member of the committee, Ileana ross Layton, to make any remarks she may choose to. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your leadership, as always. And I welcome you, and uh, I join you in welcoming our witnesses here this morning and, and uh, thank them for the time that they will spend with us today. Uh, regardless of what uh, we think the causes of global warming may be, we do need to consider how any man-made contributions to that trend might best be addressed. Some argue that it is time for the United States to agree to cut its emissions under an international agreement. Some would support a central planning approach involving orders to industries to make specific uh, quantifiable cuts in emissions, perhaps uh, regardless of the impacts on the economy. Others would support the use of some sort of market mechanism uh, in that central planning system to place a cost on the emissions of such gases that would provide an incentive for industries to cut them. Still others would uh, place an outright tax on those emissions to ensure that the cost involved provides a direct incentive to cut them and then leave it to industry to make the cuts in the emissions necessary. Other proposals point to what proponents see as current and likely future failings in the present international efforts to cut emissions, which the U.S. is not yet a part of. Uh, still other believes that, believe that the rapid development of new technologies is the best way to go and warn that an international approach has to take into account the behavior and interest of individual countries. Essentially, they argue that governments will not fulfill commitments that tend to hurt their economies and reduce job opportunities. Controls or caps on each country's emissions of gases that may cause warming of the climate appear to be the approach that many in the environmental community favor. Some experts reviewing that approach, however, raise concerns about merely ordering cuts in emissions without consideration of the economic impact they might have, including on job creation. For example, it appears that the extent to which the states of the European Union have been able to cap their emissions so far has been determined by their ability to tap into the unused emissions quota available uh, that the states of the former Soviet Union have available only because those states' emissions fall significantly, fell significantly in the years following the breakup of the Soviet Union and the economic decline that followed. We are already seeing some examples in which factories in Europe that are trying to cut their emissions are in jeopardy of going out of business or cutting their workforce or hours on the job. Other experts have been focusing on new technologies as the silver bullet solution to global warming. We should be encouraging further research and development into the in the relevant technologies, whether they relate to wind, solar, or nuclear or fossil fuel generation. And re with regard to new technologies, I'm interested in hearing the view of our panelists concerning the most recent research into carbon capture technology and whether it is as promising as it sounds. And finally, Mr. Chairman, it is doubtful that we can achieve anything in this endeavor if we do not have the cooperation of countries that have fast-growing economies such as China and India. Uh, they are rapidly becoming the leading sources of emissions of so-called greenhouse gases. And here I would like to raise the view that many have a general caution about where international agreements can lead us. 
As I have noted, some have raised the need to turn to the creation of international agreements for a solution. However, as we have seen across a number of sectors, including most recently on issues relating to proliferation and human rights, seeking consensus through such international agreements can often translate into a race to the bottom or the lowest common denominator outcomes. And such agreements will also raise concerns about possibly surrendering U.S. sovereignty to international mechanisms that can easily be manipulated to serve as anti-U.S. or anti-developed world agenda. And finally, Mr. Chairman, you have proposed legislation on the issue of uh, climate change, and uh, we received that, uh, that text uh, late last Friday. And today's hearing is uh, the only hearing that perhaps this committee may have on, on this issue. And you may ask to uh, mark up that legislation in, in the committee next week. I have asked for um, additional full committee and subcommittee hearings, Mr. Chairman, uh, to be held on the subject matter before scheduling the legislation for markup so that all the members can have an opportunity for a careful review. Some of the proposals in your bill, Mr. Chairman, uh, include a statement of congressional policy that the United States will work on emission cuts for itself and other countries under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Control, the convention to which the Kyoto Pro Protocol is now attached, as you uh, mentioned in your statement. Also uh, in the bill is the creation of the State Department Office on Global Climate Change and the authorization of a billion dollars over five years for assistance through AID to promote clean and efficient energy technologies in other countries and the creation of an international clean energy foundation that will be supported with $100 million in U.S. government funds over five years. And we ask our distinguished panelists to address some of these proposals and again hope that we will have further opportunities, Mr. Chairman, for review before we enter into the consideration of this or other uh, related bills. So I, I thank the uh, gentleman for the time. I thank very much, my friend. Any member who would like to make an opening statement, please indicate. Mr. Rohrabacher. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You know, uh, we've been going now almost a half a year, and uh, I have, every time we have a hearing, I say I, how much I agree with the chairman because it's a miracle because I'm a very conservative Republican, and the chairman obviously is of the other party. And let me just note that at last we find something where we disagree, Mr. Chairman. In every other uh, hearing that we've had, I, I, I've just been applauding the chairman. I already leadership. feel better. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so let me just uh, note that, uh, that I have a major disagreement uh, with you on this issue. Uh, this I would like to submit for the record. Uh, Without several, objection. Yeah, several articles. One here by uh, uh, MIT professor Richard Linson uh, from Newsweek, which uh, has many criticisms of those people who are trying to uh, uh, frighten the world into uh, uh, actions that are counterproductive uh, on uh, over so-called global warming. Um, Mr. Chairman, there's no doubt, and, and, and there's many quotes we have here, and also I would submit for the record uh, an article by uh, in the same Newsweek magazine uh, that uh, talks about a um, uh, the consistency with people who are suggesting that we have to move forward with global warming and uh, how there's been one report that suggests we cut down all the trees in order to combat global warming, which of course represents the type of hysteria that will lead us in the wrong direction. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we are experiencing a certain amount of warming on the planet. There is no doubt about that. And uh, I am a senior member of the Science Committee and sat through about five hearings on this with very top scientists. There is no doubt that there is a certain amount of warming going on. The question is, is whether mankind has anything to do with it any more than we have had to do with the other about 12 different cycles of warming and cooling that the Earth has gone through over its long history. Let us, uh, uh, there's no reason to believe that this, uh, this warming, which is one degree over 100 years or a degree and a half warmer now than it was 150 years ago, is caused by human activity. We know that isn't caused by human activity and probably uh, the warming on Mars and on the planets that NASA is now reporting 
is probably not caused by human activity. I would expect, uh, I, unless of course uh, there is some connection with UFOs to global warming, which I doubt. Uh, so let me just suggest, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, there is a price to pay if we get stampeded into trying to solve a problem that does not exist or something that, or, or look for solutions that, uh, uh, for things that can't be solved. If indeed it is a natural cycle caused by sunspots perhaps, as many top professors have suggested, if we go off and spend hundreds of billions of dollars, which is what uh, would cost us to, uh, with some of the plans that are for, uh, coming forward on global warming, we will take that, those resources away from doing things that make people healthier. And we will take things away from what would uh, really uh, help the poor people on this planet. And, uh, and, and finally, for the record, I would just like to read a quote, and then I'll be done with this, and we'll get into the testimony. Uh, Dr. Christopher Lancia, uh, who was indeed uh, part of, of the IPCC uh, uh, program, uh, Dr. Lancia, of course, uh, is someone who is, has, has, has very strong credentials uh, and a professor at the University of Colorado, of course has a PhD in meteorology. He suggested that he had to withdraw uh, uh, from the IPCC uh, report and withdraw his, uh, his endorsement. Uh, and it says, I have raised my concerns to the IPCC leadership. The response was simply to dismiss my concerns. Uh, I, can, I personally cannot in good faith continue to contribute to a process that I view as both being motivated by preconceived agendas and being scientifically unsound. Uh, uh, this is a, a prominent scientist. There are, there are prominent scientists throughout the world uh, who are calling uh, into question uh, the, these hysterical predictions of global warming. And in each and every case, instead of meeting their objections, Instead of going through the discussions and saying, what, is your, what are your objections, and trying to deal with it, which is the honest way of approaching uh, any major issue, uh, they have been dismissed. And every time I have heard a, uh, a report on global warming, Mr. Chairman, it always begins with the same thing. The issue is already decided, and this is nothing but a way to prevent an honest discussion of the issue itself. And I would suggest that the, we are a long way from determining that human beings are causing this cycle of warming that's happening on the planet uh, uh, any more than we caused the cycle of warming on the planet for the last other 10 cycles that the Earth has been through. So I'm interested in hearing what the witnesses have to say and participating in the dialogue. And even though we disagree, Mr. Chairman, uh, you have my 100% respect. Thank you. It's very mutual, Mr. Rohrabacher. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing on America's engagement in global efforts to fight climate change. In addition to this committee, uh, I serve on the House Energy and Commerce Committee, which will be responsible for moving legislation on climate change. Now, this issue hits close to home, literally, because the district I represent is home to much of the industry that is most to lose if we do not take a caution approach to the climate change. What American industry can do domestically is address climate change will not matter if countries like Russia, China, and India don't take steps simultaneously to cut CO2 emissions. We must ensure any legislation we pass and steps we take to address climate change are not done so unilaterally. Uh, the United States, we can provide the leadership, but we also need to make sure that, uh, that we're not adversely affecting our own economy. Doing so would not solve the problem of global warming, but result in a tremendous burden on our economy in the form of higher energy prices. Our goal should be a climate and energy policy that maximizes greenhouse gas emissions reductions on a global scale while minimizing negative impacts on our economy. Congress should evaluate all possible options to achieve this objective, including basing access to our market on reductions in the country's carbon emissions or other effective incentives. Climate change is a global problem. Let's look for a global solution. And again, I thank the chairman for holding the hearing. I look forward to our witnesses. Thank you very much. Ms. Watson of California. I want to thank uh, our chairman again, your foresight and your good common sense uh, helps to educate us all. 
And I'm very pleased um, with the witnesses that come to bring us a factual and I hope uh, empirical evidence of that we're living in an era where man must start looking at the future and to see how we can contribute to improving the future for our offsprings and those yet unborn. So the public debate on energy and global warming and climate change has shifted dramatically in the American public's mind over the past few years. And this sense of urgency is, great, uh, is uh, based in great part on the assumption that the United States of America has fallen behind as a leading innovator in devastating new developing and uh, in innovating and in developing new energy technology and instead has become a captive of big oil and the nations and the regions of the world from which it comes. Energy independence, global warming, and climate change now stand on top of the American public's agenda and are right up there with health care as one of the most important issues of the day. And simply put, America has awakened and now knows that it cannot wait to follow, but, but must lead. And uh, if we're going to change our destiny. So I feel it's very, very important that we have these hearings and have the scientists and the experts give us the input that we will need to plan for our future. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Chair recognizes our ranking member, Ross Lane, for an introduction. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Before we continue with our opening statements, uh, I'd like to take a welcome to uh, I'll take a moment to welcome uh, Congressman Bill Arrakis as our newest uh, member of, on, uh, of our committee on the Republican side of the uh, aisle. In addition to his new role, Gus serves on the House Committee on Homeland Security as well as a member of the Committee on Veterans Affairs. He's recognized for his uh, spirit of uh, bipartisanship and fairness and accomplishment of uh, key priorities. And I, I know that he's going to be a uh, make a valuable addition to our uh, to our committee. I had the great honor of uh, serving, as many of us did, with uh, Gus's dad, Mike, for many years, and I've known uh, Gus for for many years as well as uh, he was a state legislator. And I ask, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that uh, Gus be assigned to both the subcommittee on Europe and the subcommittee on Middle East and South Asia. And unfortunately, we have to say goodbye to Congressman McCotter. He's joining the Financial Services Committee. He's been a member of our Foreign Affairs Committee for uh, four and a half years, and his participation will surely be missed. But uh, Mr. Bill Arrakis will overshadow him in no time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, without objection, uh, Thank you. Mr. Welcome Bill Arrakis will be assigned to those two subcommittees. And, and again, welcome. Like our colleague said, I served many years on the Energy and Commerce Committee with your father, and welcome to Congress. Uh, our next member is Congressman, Congresswoman Lynn Woolsey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just traveled to China before Easter, and we had a round table of, of uh, members of Congress and uh, scholars, Chinese scholars, uh, and we were, were discussing global warming. And uh, one of the Chinese scholars said, well, it is the opinion and the thought of the Chinese that the United States has used up more than your fair share of the uh, resources around the world, and you've caused more than your fair share of pollution. Now it's our turn. Well, my response was, yes, indeed, we've absolutely taken advantage and used more of our share than we should have, and we need to make up for that. But there is no time for China to have a turn if we intend to have any kind of atmosphere and environment for all the children of the world. So I am really looking forward to hearing from you. And this is a, a global concern, and uh, we have to work on it globally. Thank you very much. Ms. Bozeman is from Arkansas. 
Thank you. Uh, I really don't have much comment except for the fact we appreciate you being here. This certainly is, is a very important topic. And uh, again, uh, look forward to, uh, you know, working, doing things based on sound science and, uh, you know, trying to take the emotion out of this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Chair recognizes Mr. Crowley from New York. I have no opening statement, but I look forward to hearing your testimony. Mr. Miller. Uh, Mr. Chair, on the off chance that the witnesses know more about their life's work than the members of the committee do, I will waive an <laughs> opening statement so we may hear from them. As my colleagues have done in order to uh, get to the witnesses as quickly as possible, I will forego making an opening statement at this time. Thank you. Mr. Bilirakis, opening statement. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. It's just an honor to serve on this committee with you and uh, Chairman Lantos and my good friend, Ranking Member Eliana ross Layden, and I uh, look forward to doing some good work. Thanks so much. No more opening statements. Uh, again, welcome to our panel, and uh, I will introduce uh, our panel. Um, Aline Klossman is one of the great recognized experts on climate change as well as environmental issues more broadly. She is currently the president of the Pew Center on Global Climate Change and strategies for the global environment. Ms. Clausen is the former Assistant Secretary for Oceans and, and in International Environmental and Scientific Affairs, where she dealt with issues ranging from ozone depletion, climate change, natural resources. Prior to that position, she served for three years on the National Security Council as Special Assistant to the President as Senior Director for Global Environmental Affairs. From 1987 to 1993, Ms. Clausen was Director of As At atmospheric programs at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, capping a long and distinguished career at the EPA by spearheading policies, reversing the much publicized uh, hole in the ozone layer. She executive editor of the book, Climate Change, Science and Strategies and Solutions. We look forward to your testimony, Ms. Clausen. Let me, why don't I go ahead and introduce all our witnesses and that way we'll just go from witness to witness. Uh, our next distinguished witness is Dr. Javid Girard, is currently the Vice President at the World Resources Institute and Environmental Think Tank, Tank focused on feasible solutions. He served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Energy for International Energy Policy in the Clinton-Gore administration. In that post, he led the United States bilateral energy negotiations with all key energy producing and consuming countries, and he served as Vice Chair of the International Energy Agency. Uh, Dr. Girard, has authored more than 100 publications on energy security and climate issues. He's received his doctorate in applied physics from Harvard University. He was a senior energy advisor to the USAID and a senior scientist at Brookhaven National Laboratory. We're pleased to have a witness with such an extensive background in international energy policy and cooperation, Dr. Girard. Uh, the floor will be yours shortly. <laughs> uh, W. David Montgomery is Vice President of the Consultancy CRA, where he serves as co-head of the firm's International Environmental Energy and Environmental Practice. He was principal lead author of the second assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Working Group 3. The IPCC is the international body tasked with assessing climate change and its ramifications. Dr. Montgomery is an expert on economics surrounding climate change and climate change policy. Dr. Montgomery's current research deals with the design of energy, R&D policy, as well as the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in developing countries. Prior to joining CRE, he was the Assistant Director of the Con U.S. Congressional Budget Office and Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy in the U.S. Department of Energy. He taught economics at the California Institute of Technology and Stanford University. He was a senior fellow at Resources of the Future. Dr. Montgomery, again, welcome. And Ms. Clausen, if you'll proceed. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on this critical issue. Uh, my name is Eileen Clausen, and I'm the president of the Pew Center on Global Climate Change. Let me summarize my written statement by responding to the questions I was asked to address. Can global greenhouse concentrations be stabilized without obtaining binding pledges from key developing countries? I believe that stabilizing greenhouse gas concentrations at safe levels will require binding commitments from all the major emitting countries, both developed and developing. However, the form of commitment need not be the same for all countries. 
there is tremendous diversity among the major economies. 25 countries account for about 85% of global greenhouse gas emissions, 70% of global population, and 85% of global GDP. But their per capita emissions range by a factor of 14, and their per capita incomes by a factor of 18. Policies and pathways that work for some of these countries will not work for others. We need a flexible international framework that accommodates different national strategies and circumstances. However, while we should allow a variety of approaches, these must be integrated in a common overarching framework since no country can sustain an ambitious climate effort if its counterparts are not contributing their fair share. What might the elements of a new agreement look like? We believe there are five potential elements of a post-2012 framework. The first is economy-wide emission targets and trading, similar to what is proposed for the United States in many of the major climate bills now before Congress. Emission targets provide environmental certainty, while trading harnesses market forces to deliver reductions at the lowest possible cost. However, China, India, and other developing countries are highly unlikely to accept binding economy-wide emission limits because they believe such targets will limit their economic growth. An alternative approach for them could be policy-based commitments, where they undertake national policies, energy efficiency or renewable energy targets, for example. These commitments would need to be credible and binding, with mechanisms to ensure close monitoring and compliance. A third potential element would target emissions from a specific sector. Such agreements could resolve competitiveness concerns in energy-intensive industries whose goods trade globally, for example, aluminum production. A fourth potential element is technology cooperation, both to jointly develop critical breakthrough technologies, such as carbon capture and storage, and to help ensure equitable access globally to both existing and new technologies. Finally, a post-2012 framework must provide stronger international support for adaptation efforts in the poor countries that are most vulnerable to climate impacts and least able to cope. Should a new fr climate framework set a specific long-term goal for stabilizing greenhouse gas concentrations? A quantified long-term goal could be extremely valuable in driving climate action, signaling markets, and establishing a metric to, a guide and assess, to guide and assess our near and medium-term efforts. However, we do not believe such a goal should be negotiated, nor should it be the basis for commitments. The U.S. Climate Action Partnership, of which the Pew Center is a founding partner, recommends stabilizing global greenhouse concentrations at a carbon dioxide equivalent level of 450 to 550 parts per million. There would be great benefit if such a target could be accepted without negotiation. Does the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change provide a viable foundation for a post-2012 framework? We believe the Framework Convention is the appropriate venue for negotiating new climate commitments. The Convention enshrines key principles that have been universally accepted and is flexible enough to accommodate any of the approaches I've described. However, the broad political consensus needed for such negotiations to succeed may be most readily achieved through high-level dialogue outside the formal process. But once achieved, this consensus should be, be carried back into the Framework Convention for the negotiation of formal agreements. Finally, what steps can the United States take, United States take to most effectively re-engage in the global climate effort? An effective multilateral response to climate change is possible only with U.S. engagement and leadership. The most critical step we can take to encourage global action is to establish a mandatory program to limit and reduce U.S. emissions. We also must help lead a renewed multilateral effort, both formally within the framework convention process and informally outside the process. Engaging developing countries will require a firm but balanced approach. We must be absolutely clear in our expectation that the major developing countries assume binding commitments in a post-2012 framework. In establishing mandatory limits on our own emissions, we will have begun to fulfill the commitment we made with other developed countries to lead the climate effort. Having done so, it will then be reasonable to expect that countries like China fulfill their responsibilities as well. China's emissions have grown 80 percent since 1990 and could rise another 80 percent by 2020. It is essential that these trends be reversed. Realistically, this will also require incentives for them to undertake strong climate efforts. But in return for these incentives, China and the other major developing countries must assume appropriate commitments 
that will slow and ultimately reverse the growth of their greenhouse gas emissions. To summarize, I believe it is incumbent upon the United States to lead both by strong action at home and by actively and constructively reengaging in the international climate effort. Only with strong U.S. participation and leadership can we achieve a fair and effective global response to the critical challenge of climate change. I thank the committee for the opportunity to present these views and would be happy to answer any questions. <coughs> Dr. Girai. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman um, and distinguished members of the committee. Uh, thank you. I'm David Girard, Vice President for Science and Research of the World Resources Institute. According to the International Energy Agency, the world has embarked on an energy path that is incompatible with achieving a stable climate for the Earth and its people. And that uh, the IEA also confirms that we are following an energy trajectory that is economically and financially unstable and poses serious threats of regional and global conflict. In spite of the fact that we face, as a nation and the international community, we face daunting challenges in transforming this situation, the long-term solutions are, as the chairman said earlier, to stabilize greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere, to enhance energy security, and to reduce the risk of economic and political disruption, and the task of providing commercial energy to four billion people on the planet and mobilizing over 20 trillion in capital mobilization uh, over the next 25 years for uh, energy infrastructure. I will not dwell on the science of climate change, uh, to, except to say that the uh, end of the scientific debate has essentially occurred and there are now calls for action. The focus has turned to action and it's essential that the United States take strong action at the national level to reduce emissions. The rest of the world cannot solve this problem if we stay out, and action by the United States will make it clear that in tomorrow's markets there will be a price for carbon and will give U.S. companies an advantage in preparing to compete in those markets. This is why 21 leading U.S. businesses, including large energy consumers such as General Electric, AIG, Alcoa, Caterpillar, DuPont, John Deere, Duke, and others, and of which WRI, the World Resources Institute, and my companion, my colleague here from uh, the Pew Center joined in this group. They called on and urged Congress to enact mandatory measures to slow, stop, and reverse the growth in U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. This U.S. Climate Action Partnership was formed in January, and it's issued a call for action that provides recommendations to the Congress and the administration on mandatory economy-wide policy designed to achieve emissions reductions of 60 to 80 percent by 2050. It's essential, an essential prerequisite for our re-engaging in the international arena is that we have credibility and legitimacy at home. We need to have strong federal legislation that captures the twin benefits of reduced petroleum consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. This will allow us to play a more constructive role in international fora along the lines that my colleague has just described. And uh, it is absolutely key that our credibility uh, in the international arena be established at home by establishing a price for carbon. We know how to create markets and we know how to make them work. And this is the vital starting point if we are to re-engage the rest of the world. And the drivers for this transformation are clear. They have to be government policy and private sector development. Uh, we have uh, a very hopeful sign uh, is the looking at what kinds of technologies we will need and what scale we will need them on to stabilize greenhouse gas emissions and later concentrations. There's a simple, powerful idea that despite this daunting problem that I've described, we have the potential to solve it if we can deploy today's technology at sufficient scale. This way, this allows us a way of coming to grips with the problem of technologies to scale, such as carbon capture and storage, uh, efficient transportation and vehicle technologies, biofuels from cellulosic and other non uh, starch sources, uh, and uh, renewables uh, on an unprecedented scale. The, the important point here is that we can solve this problem. We can solve this with uh, policy leadership, policy innovation, technological innovation, and capital investment. We will need more than $20 trillion, as I said, over the next 25 years in the world to invest in technology. It, there's, or there are already signs that Wall Street is paying attention to this. Citibank has assigned 
uh, a fund of $50 billion for non-carbon, zero-carbon technologies, and we see that others in the financial community are beginning to factor climate risk into their investment portfolios. That sends a very important signal to the rest of the world. Turning to India and China, greenhouse gases are not an immediate concern, but what is a concern is the rush for investment, energy security, and the staggering cost of pollution in terms of human lives. Uh, what I would suggest, uh, again from my own experience at the International Energy Agency, is that there's a strong case to be made to include India and China as member countries of the International Energy Agency, where they will participate along with other countries in, uh, in transparent regulatory and other measures to attract capital to clean energy technologies. I, uh, m much of what I have said is in my written testimony, um, members of the committee. So I'll quickly move to a few specific points that I'd like to leave you with. Clearly, we will need innovation on all fronts. We'll need financial innovation. That's already occurring because no single investment structure will fit the requirements of this diverse market. We certainly need policy innovation. Uh, and we need policy innovation uh, to spur technological innovation, both domestically and, uh, and uh, in the international arena. We need policies to be clear, to be unambiguous, to apply over a time scale that counts, and that need, they need to be mandatory, legal, and enforceable. And uh, these, these, are these are policies that will benefit both energy security and climate change. I will just say a few things about promoting clean energy and energy efficiency technologies. I think uh, the chairman's bill uh, makes mention about uh, there's a major scope to expand federal programs that promote clean energy exports and technology partnerships. Uh, many of these programs that currently exist are sadly underfunded, and uh, very few of the provisions of the Energy Policy Act of 1992 have been implemented owing to a lack of federal funding. I think we have a huge opportunity here to improve our competitiveness in these technologies in the international arena. I would say there is an opportunity here for USAID, where I formerly served as senior science and energy advisor, uh, for our foreign commercial services, particularly in India and China, and with programs at OPIC and Exxon. And it's clear that federal programs of this kind can work because we already engage key countries and regions and create private-public partnerships and Congress could increase their chances of success by creating incentives for companies to enter new markets and authorizing additional resources. And as I said earlier, Citigroup has already announced the creation of its own $50 billion investment fund for these technologies. Finally, I think we should also focus on adaptation. Uh, General Anthony Zinni and a group of other generals and senior military personnel issued a report, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, called National Security and the Threat of Climate Change indicating that climate change, national security, and energy dependence are rela a related set of global challenges, and that climate change acts as a threat multiplier for instability in some of the most volatile regions of the world, and that unless uh, we uh, take action uh, in Asia, where hundreds of millions of people rely on waters from vanishing glaciers, uh, in uh, the, where about 40 percent of the population of Asia, nearly four billion uh, people live within 45 miles of the, uh, the, the long coastline and are danger from sea level rise, uh, that the uh, location and topography of a country like Bangladesh makes it one of the most vulnerable countries in the world to sea level, and the, the specter of uh, hundreds of millions of refugees is something that the generals are certainly taking very seriously, both in Asia and in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, because sub-Saharan Africa is one of the most vulnerable areas in the world to uh, sea level rise, climate change, desertification, crop failures, and again, uh, the possibility of migration across the uh, Mediterranean. So we face daunting problems, new and difficult problems in our foreign aid and foreign policy. We need to re-engage with the international community in a constructive way focusing on not just the two billion people at the top of the pyramid, but also the four billion people at the bottom of the pyramid who could be the markets of tomorrow. And finally, I think leadership requires a vision of where we want to go as a nation and taking strong domestic action that stabilizes the climate of our planet and assures energy and economic security for the entire world is a goal worthy 
of the United States. And Congress has an important role to play in reestablishing American leadership, in clarifying our national and international policy, and in persevering long enough to show results. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Montgomery. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I appreciate your invitation. Uh, I'm David Montgomery. I'm Vice President of CRA International. Uh, I'd like to mention that I'm solely responsible for my testimony today, and it doesn't necessarily represent the position of either CRA International or any of our clients. Um, I will summarize my testimony, and I'd like to request that my longer statement be entered in the record. The Kyoto, it's my opinion that the Kyoto Protocol is a flawed approach to global action on climate, and with or without the United States is unlikely to achieve anything close to the goal of stabilizing greenhouse gas concentrations in an acceptable range. Um, as my prepared statement discusses in more detail, many students of international agreements have pointed out that the unenforceability of the Kyoto Protocol makes its stability in the long term doubtful. In addition, it fails on the two highest priorities of climate policy. It cannot stimulate the technological advances that are required to make stabilization of temperatures affordable, and it's not engaging developing countries sufficiently to make a difference. Uh, mandatory U.S. greenhouse gas controls in any version of the Kyoto Protocol will, um, would impose a significant cost on the U.S. economy. In previous studies looking at a range of proposals for U.S. emission caps, uh, my colleagues and I have estimated annual losses that would range from about three-tenths of a percent of GDP to almost two percent of GDP in 2020, depending on which of the bills that's now under consideration might be adopted. By raising the cost of U.S. industry, mandatory controls would also lead to a shift of investment away from the U.S. and toward countries like China and India that are not willing to undertake similar efforts. By creating these competitive advantages, adherence to the Kyoto Protocol by in industrial countries will actually strengthen the incentives for Ch countries like China and India to resist controls. Once China and India build industries that depend on a difference in energy costs to succeed, it will become, pol become politically even more difficult for their governments and others in the same position to undertake policies that threaten those interests. Thus far from providing a moral example that will bring countries like China into an international agreement, Naive unilateral action can create economic disincentives for those countries to limit their emissions. Because China and India and other developing countries will be responsible for the majority of global emissions over the next century, any prospect for halting global warming depends crucially on inducing them to cut their emissions. Even industri if industrial countries achieved zero emissions by 2035, Unless developing countries followed suit, global emissions would continue to rise and stabilization of concentrations would be impossible at any level. Um, nevertheless, there is an immense potential for cost-effective emission reductions in developing countries. However, at this point, institutional and market failures in those countries and governance issues, like the ones we see about China's uh, introduction of melamine into wheat gluten, make it highly unlikely that efficient market-based policies will be effective in those countries. Um, my conclusion is that the potential for low-cost emission reductions in developing countries can be unlocked only if those countries adopt the deep institutional reforms that are necessary for the efficient functioning of markets and sustained economic growth. Some reform of this kind has been what's triggered the, the economic growth in China and India, a great deal more is necessary in order to make it possible to, for them to implement policies as efficiently and effectively as many assume. Designing an international agreement that can lead to inter institutional reform will be difficult, because such reform has proven difficult throughout the world and is opposed by powerful interests in China and India. I think the greatest U.S. contribution in, in, in international engagement would be to convince the rest of the world to recognize and confront these difficulties in a realistic way. Designing an international agreement that can lead to cooperative R&D, technological advance and technology transfer, on the other hand, is quite feasible. To be effective, I believe that negotiations for a post-2012 agreement should be removed from the UN framework and confined to the top 10 to, thir say, 13 to 20 countries in total emissions. Uh, as Ms. Clausen mentioned, these countries cover 75 to 80 percent of global emissions. And the agenda should include cooperative R&D, mechanisms to address institutional change, investment climates in developing countries, and technology transfer. I also agree with Ms. Claus that ultimately the ultimate, that the ultimate objective of stabilizing greenhouse gas concentrations at some level needs to be kept in mind, but it's pointless to negotiate specific concentration goals until a framework conducive to technological advance and developing country participation is created. There's no point in discussing 
at great length or setting in feasible goals, and we don't know what's feasible until we know what we can do on technology and getting the developing countries involved. The experience of the Kyoto Protocol does suggest to me a few guiding principles for a realistic and effective architecture. First is avoid creating perverse incentives. This has been one of the clearest failings of the Kyoto Protocol. It encourages developing countries to stay out. It does not provide any incentive for countries to stay in. And it's designed, the design of one process for involving developing countries, the CDM, has proved vulnerable to gaming. Um, I think I'm making a similar recommendation to Ms. Clausen, which is that um, to create an effective an agreement, an agreement in which parties have an incentive to live up to their commitments, we need some form of pledge and review to replace targets and timetables. This involves a discussion of concrete actions that can be monitored effectively and have credible consequences for failure. I also think it's important for us to be clear about our broader foreign policy objectives in these negotiations and focus benefits on those in need. Um, a global emission trading regime would require massive wealth transfers to convince China to join under current circumstances and provide almost nothing to the poorest countries. I think there are legitimate arguments that the industrial countries should bear the cost of protecting the poorest, but it's difficult to see why we have any moral obligation to pay China to participate. A focus on institutional change in these negotiations to make it possible for developing countries to reconcile growth with cl a clean environment would not only benefit China, but it would also aid the poorest by helping put them on a path to sustained and environmentally sound economic growth. I'd also suggest we concentrate on the highest priorities first. I think that for the industrial countries, that priority has to be cooperative approaches to technology development. Technologies does not exist today that would allow us to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations globally at an affordable cost. And cooperative technology R&D can contribute to solving that problem. For negotiations with developing countries, the focus should be on promoting institutional change that will create efficient markets and a favorable investment climate that can reconcile economic growth with lower emissions. Timing of reductions in emissions from industrial countries needs to be paced by both te technology and developing country participation to avoid of getting ahead of what can be afforded and to avoid creating undesirable incentives for the uh, developing countries to lag behind. Um, and uh, my final point would be to reiterate the, uh, that in, in answer to your question about the framework convention, I think little is going to come out of negotiations that have to involve nearly 200 parties, most of them having primary agendas completely unrelated to climate change, and that getting out from under this process, dealing with the big emitters, 13, of, 13 is a number that has been picked because that gets Australia into it, something between 13 and 20 is probably feasible. And I think it could be complemented with regional and bilateral discussions such as the Asia-Pacific Partnership and the U.S.-India Strategic Partnership, which can supplement these negotiations and actually provide examples of how to achieve effective engagement with developing countries. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and again, thank our witnesses for being here and your expertise. Um, I yield myself uh, five minutes, and, and uh, I just had a very long question, and I'll try and go through it very quickly. Uh, not only for Ms. Clausen, but our, our three panelists. Uh, one of the reasons the U.S. is in such a strong position to direct a climate change debate is because of our strong economy and our market. I'm concerned about the U.S. adopting a cap and trade legislation unilaterally and putting the burden of solving this problem on our domestic manufacturers that produce energy intensive materials such as steel, aluminum, uh, cement, and fertilizer. If these companies are forced to follow a cap and trade while their international competitors are not, they would. Uh, they will not be able to stay competitive. Can we expect a cap and trade program to raise energy prices if that happens in, um, in the United States in a reasonable estimate? Will U.S. firms and, and workers suffer a competitive disadvantage against energy intensive products sold in U.S. markets but manufactured abroad where there are no greenhouse gas control? And if Congress is willing to regulate how much greenhouse glass gases are produced in manufacturing set certain products sold in the U.S. regardless of origin, foreign or domestic, does Congress have the power to do that kind of environmental regulation give that, given that our environmental uh, greenhouse, gas, greenhouse gases where they're released affect the U.S. climate, whether it's in the United States or China? And, um, if Congress took this approach, would foreign and domestic manufacturers have to comply with these regulations, even if no treaty exists between us in order to sell in our market? Uh, my point is, we don't have some leverage in these countries that want to sell in our, our market, 
and uh, seems like we would if we're going to comply with the greenhouse gas issues. I think the kind of country we, as a leader, we need to be the leader, but we also need to make sure that uh, that we bring the rest of the world along along with us. Is there a comment from on that particular question or any variation of that question? Um, maybe I can uh, go first here. Um, I think the key to a cap and trade, which we believe should be the cornerstone of U.S. policy for itself, um, is that we do it in a rational way and not expect to do more than we can do faster than we can do it. Um, and I think if you look at the call to action from the U.S. Climate Action Partnership, uh, it doesn't start immediately. It gives us a little bit of breathing room. Um, it moves in a, in a steady pace downward. And I think in the early stages, uh, most of the reductions here in the U.S. will come from energy efficiency, which is actually a win-win for most companies. Now, with respect to the energy-intensive industries, um, let me just say that we work with 43 large companies, including many energy-intensive industries, uh, cement, aluminum, um, and others. And um, it is their point of view that there are things that can be done even within those sectors if they're done on a global basis. And so we have suggested that global sectoral agreements that deal with, for example, aluminum or cement would actually be the best way to deal with competitiveness concerns. And the aluminum industry, for example, is already starting discussions on a global basis on how to do that and to set benchmarks for the industry as a whole. And the same is true in the cement industry. Um, I think there are others that might follow suit, like steel. Um, but I think that is perhaps the best way to deal with competitiveness concerns, um, because I think those are legitimate, not for everything in the U.S. economy, but for those energy-intensive industries. Dr. Girard, a comment? Uh, <clears throat> just make a, a couple of points. Uh, one is that, um, that the industries who are working with us in the U.S. Climate Action Partnership uh, are urging the Congress in this unusual way to uh, pass strong legislation because for three reasons. One is they feel that it creates a level playing field, uh, certainly across the country. Not a lot of, not a patchwork quilt of different state uh, regulatory structures. Uh, and uh, uh, so it's a, it's a, uh, a common coherent uh, s uh, s regulatory framework. Uh, the second is that they feel that uh, giving these policy signals encourages innovation in those companies. Uh, uh, innovation both in uh, clean energy, energy efficiency, and renewables. Uh, uh, GE has pointed out that its eco-imagination initiative, which they expected to net $10 billion uh, in 2010, uh, reached that target two uh, quarters ago. So they see this as a way to become more competitive as an incentive to produce higher quality technologies at lower cost. I do think that the, there is a legitimate point to be made about competitiveness, and I think um, Ms. Clausen has uh, made some of the points we feel are important, but we are also uh, looking hard at uh, uh, some of the, uh, the, the tools that are available to us in the trade arena, uh, in addition to ones she's talked about, and we, you know, we believe in saying things that we've analyzed, and so hopefully we will be able to provide an analysis of how these systems might affect competitiveness in the near future. <laughs> Dr. Montgomery, okay. briefly, if you please. Thank you. Yes, um, I think there is a cost uh, to a cap and trade system and an impact on the U.S. economy. It depends on how tight the caps are and how the carb and how high the a carbon price um, would appear in the market with those caps. That's very hard to predict. That's one of the reasons why proposals or a carbon for either a carbon tax, which was would be set by the Congress, or a safety valve. Um, I think have been made. They can limit the damage and they allow for a choice of how high a price to tolerate based in part on how much harm to competitive industries um, is tolerable or at what point um, that, that harm would begin to appear. Can we do something about imports that would be competitive? I think I, that is an immensely com complex issue of the GATT rules and the rules of the World Trade Organization. Um, there does it, there do a, it's clearly something that's worth looking at. Uh, the rules suggest that there are immense differences in what kind of policy instrument that is used in the U.S. and how one treats it. And um, I think uh, and this is a subject that requires, I think, several more hearings to explore in any way. So I'm not going to try to give a simple answer because there is none. Um, I think actually the, the real solution is global engagement because the issue here is the U.S. doing something which gets out too far ahead 
of what developing countries are willing to do to come along with us. Even WTO is a negotiation process rather than something that we can appeal to as a set of clear uh, statutory law. And so I think all of that suggests that engagement with developing countries, bringing these competitive issues to the fore and trying to concentrate on kind of how they can do similar things in industries that are competitive with ours is probably the only real long-term solution. Thank you. Chair recognizes our ranking member. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I wanted to follow up uh, on uh, similar themes uh, that you had brought up, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a Washington Post article of uh, April 9th uh, entitled, Europe's Problems Color U.S. Plans to Curb Carbon Gases, noted that a uh, French cement company fears that as it meets emission cuts mandated by the Kyoto Protocol, it will steadily lose work to cement companies in Morocco. Those companies don't have to meet those commitments because Morocco is a developing country. And as the article noted, this type of situation raises the question, how will companies that are forced to meet emission reductions and pay for the cost associated with that meet competition from similar industries in other countries that don't have to cut their emissions nor pay for a tax on those emissions. And this is an important question, one that is critical to U.S. policy in the future. If we join an emissions control regime, how will we ensure that American companies and our workers are helped to stand up to competition from foreign produced goods made in countries that will not be required to greatly reduce their emissions and therefore will not have to pay the costs associated with that. And, uh, and I'll ask uh, both questions if I could, Mr. Chairman, and then leave the time for our excellent panelists to answer. Uh, Klaus Lachner of uh, Columbia University believes that large-scale carbon capture technology can be put into operation in the near term. But the U.S. Energy Department's Assistant Secretary for Fossil Fuels recently stated that carbon sequestration technologies would not be ready for widespread deployment until the year 2045. What are your views on this debate over the near-term availability and utilization of large-scale carbon capture or sequestration technologies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll listen to the uh, uh, answer. Um, maybe I can answer your second question first. Um, I believe we are far closer to being able to uh, implement carbon capture and sequestration um, than the Department of Energy does. I do think we need a large-scale demonstration program um, that both deals with the capture issue and also with the sequestration issue in different geographies and different geologies. Um, we have suggested, and we're in, in the middle of some work on this, that you need about 10 demonstrations to really show that it's feasible, um, and about 30 if you really want to bring down the cost enough to make uh, continued coal use cost competitive. And quite honestly, 50 percent of our electricity comes from coal. We have lots of coal. We're going to continue to use it. So I think the imperative is there for us to do this in a, in a really significant way. Um, it seems to me that we should be ready to see wide-scale implementation of this well before 2020, um, not 2045. And I think it is one of the most urgent things that the Congress should do, and that is to deal with coal, carbon capture, and sequestration. Um, on, your, on your issue about um, cement, um, n number one, I think you have to make sure that the Well, I, I didn't mean it, it was on cement. No, but on it was energy about intensive industries. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you have to make sure that um, the largest, most, most significant emitting countries are part of any agreement. Uh, we think the number is 20 or 25. That's 85 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we also believe that for all of those energy intensive industries, we should pursue as governments and as industry sectoral agreements that deal with competitiveness issues. I think that is the, the best way to move forward. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'll, I'll also uh, answer the easier question first, which is the <laughs> carbon uh, capture and sequestration. Uh, the, uh, the most important uh, scientific document in this uh, came out very recently, which was a report by the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, on, on the future of coal. 
And um, very clearly, to do this on a very large scale, which means storing a billion tons of carbon dioxide every year, this is a scale that's a couple of orders of magnitude greater than it, what is done in, in oil and gas fields, uh, that this does require some demonstration projects, as uh, Ms. Clausen pointed out. There are some uh, science uncertainties, and there are some uh, geological uncertainties, and we need to do this, uh, and we need to start very quickly to authorize some very large-scale uh, demonstrations to show that it can be captured on that scale. Uh, th the second point is that uh, the scientists who I spoke with are, are quite clear that there needs to be a carbon dioxide price or a carbon price for uh, large-scale carbon capture and storage to be viable. And the price they propose is something of the order of uh, $30 a ton of carbon dioxide. So clearly this is, this is an additional expense, but it is one of the most important things that our Congress can do is to begin to authorize uh, an R&D program in large-scale carbon capture and storage that we can do along with other countries such as India and China. Uh, that, that would be a good way to do this. Uh, we are in an international thermonuclear fusion uh, research effort with many countries, including India, China, and Brazil, and something of this nature uh, would qualify for that. I also do feel that uh, we are talking, and certainly this is the consensus of people who really looked at this issue, that before 2020 is a feasible time frame. I think 2045 is too long. Um, on the second point, I don't have much to add till we've finished our analysis of the problem, but I do think it's the subject of sectoral agreements. That, and we really, look, re really need to look very hard at, at how these sectoral agreements might be structured um, from a trade point of view. This is quite complicated, and I don't have any simple answers uh, for this. Thank you. Um, I can say even less about carbon capture and sequestration, so I'll just add the one point that I think both of my colleagues have left out, which is it strikes me the real potential showstopper on carbon capture and storage is not the technology, are not technological issues. Those can be solved with sufficient research, as they've been describing. It's the legal liability and regulatory framework that is adopted for, for carbon capture and storage that is really going to the issue. Private firms are going to be are going to find it difficult to invest in, in storage of CO2 underground if they are threatened with either having to shut down their operations when EPA detects a tiny, tiny leak or with liability 100 years from now when the price of carbon might be astronomical. That a realistic regulatory and liability regime needs to be developed and um, uh, Congress may want to think about how to set some guidelines for that. Uh, as to your first question, I really see no way of dealing with these issues of competitive harm and maintaining the viability of industries like cement in particular um, without making sure that the, the, develop, the countries in which the competitors are located come along in the international negotiations at basically the same pace the U.S. is moving at and that the U.S. kind of uh, limit how high a price we put on carbon um, to a level that is consistent with what those countries are doing to maintain competitive balance. Um, anything else, I think, is going to be a very difficult road to uh, trying to, pr to protect those industries. Thank you to the panelists and thank you to the chairman. From Massachusetts, uh, Congressman Delahunt. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Montgomery, Dr. Montgomery, over here. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, I, I just want are you all in agreement that the issue of climate change is, is serious? Do you agree, well, I think, with the statement made by Ms. Claussen that the science has concluded uh, that the issue of global warming, climate change, has to be addressed? Yes. I think there are immense uncertainties about just about everything in the subject, but it's clear that there are risks, and those risks need to be addressed and managed and reduced. Thank you, Mr. Montgomery. Um, I recently returned from, uh, from Germany, and uh, it was fascinating to me to note what the German government and, and private industry have have accomplished there in terms of renewable, uh, renewable energies. We all hear of um, the transformation, if you will, of 
Brazil in terms of transportation fuels. I'm concerned, and tell me if my concern is valid, that the United States is slipping behind uh, in terms of renewable technologies. And if we are, how do we address it? Um, and how did this occur? Um, anyone on the panel? Could I start for this, since you were? Sure. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, I don't think we're slipping behind on renewable technologies. I think we know quite well how to do uh, what is the current state of the art with renewable technologies, and that it's a matter of, of choice, of what cost we're willing to pay in order to use renewable fuels because of their environmental benefits. For moving ahead, I think that the world is not moving fast enough on technology, but the only way I can see doing something about it is a resolve, is the creation, is putting our money where, where our concern is. We need to appropriate substantially more money for R&D at the federal level, and we need to think about ways of using our federal resources to create incentives for the private sector to develop technologies and make the choices. And indeed, I think it has to go all the way back to a very much more concerted effort to push for breakthrough R&D that cre can create totally new technologies that are going to be you know, providing us ways of living without greenhouse gas. I, I appreciate that, uh, that answer, and I, I find it reassuring because I really do think that Wall Street has woken up mm -hmm. uh, to the economic benefits to to the nation in terms of renewable energies, and I concur with that. Anyone else? Um, I would just say that what's happened in the last six months to a year has been absolutely phenomenal, uh, phenomenal in terms of what Wall Street is doing in terms of sure. factoring in climate risk. I think this is something we would never have predicted. I would agree that R&D budgets, not just in the United States, but in the whole OECD, uh, have been uh, declining in real terms over the last 20 years. This reverse has to be changed. And thirdly, we need a better uh, mechanism for cost and risk sharing with the private sector so that these technologies can get into the marketplace a lot more quickly. We need to accelerate that flow from the lab into the marketplace. And there are mechanisms, proven mechanisms for doing it, which we need to adopt. So not just more money, it's also having qualitatively better ways of partnering with the private sector to speed this up. Our venture capital industry is investing very heavily in innovations right. that are extraordinary. But what I'm concerned about is that if we don't have a clear policy environment, we'll be wonderful at bringing the innovations out, but then the commercialization and capturing the market will go to other we'll countries. Stall. One, fi one, final, um, w one final question. Um, you know, in the Department of State, obviously this committee has jurisdiction over the Department of, of, of State. Is there a, a lead? Is there a point person, uh, the bureau within the department that is, is uh, guiding our relationship uh, in terms of climate change as it interacts in the international community? And if there's none, ought to be one. Mrs. Claussen. Um, I think actually it's rather diffuse in the current administration. I mean, there is someone um, who works solely on climate change. Um, the Assistant Secretary of State for Oceans, Environment, and Science, which is a position I once had, um, is not that involved in climate change. At the ministerial level, it's the Undersecretary for Global Affairs that does some work on this. But there is no, in my opinion, real focal point uh, for someone to really well, take I, the my, lead. My there. point is, if, if, there, if you all concur that there's a dire urgency to address this, ought there be a reconfiguration within the Department of State to represent the United States' position in terms not just of the Kyoto Protocol, not just of multilateral agreements, but in terms of promoting the United States uh, and its efforts to market, if you will, our hope for uh, innovative technologies that will come two, five, ten years down the line? I, I think the answer is yes, and it probably should be some combination of global climate change and energy um, because they are so closely linked. Okay. Thank you. Congressman Robach. Uh Thank you very much. And uh, 
again, let me just note, uh, um, you mentioned that uh, the scientific uh, uh, principles are universally accepted, that that just is not the case. And there are hundreds of scientists, prominent scientists from major universities around the world who disagree with that, and many of whom have been have complained that they are actually being stifled and that their objections are not being made part of the debate, uh, as we see in every discussion where the decision's already been made, it's already, uh, and thus dismissing arguments without having to uh, take the intellectual honesty of going through the objections of very prominent people. For example, uh, Dr. Timothy Ball, who is a uh, climatology professor at University of Winnipeg, very respected man, uh, I have a quote uh, from him where he says, believe it or not, global warming is not due to human contribution of carbon dioxide, CO2. Uh, this, is in, this, in fact, is the greatest deception in the history of science. We are wasting time, energy, and trillions of dollars while creating unnecessary fear and consternation over an issue with no scientific justification, end of quote. Um, and again, people, uh, the, the many, many scientists who object to this stampeding of the public on this issue uh, point out that the Earth has. We're not talking about whether or not the Earth is getting a little warmer, because the Earth is getting a little warmer, as it has in many, many cycles before it. Uh, in fact, uh, the hearings that I've uh, been through in the Science Committee <clears throat> indicate that uh, since 1850, there's been a one and a half degree temperature rise in the Earth's temperature. Uh, the trouble with it is, is the people who are presenting that to us did not mention that 1850 happened to be, in that time period, happened to be at the very tail end of a 500 year decline of world temperatures. So they took this time we should be so upset about that there's a, <laughs> a degree and a half change they took the, the temperature that they baseline at the end of a 500 year decline of Earth's temperatures. Uh, not something that we should be uh, concerned about. It's also pointed out by some of these very same scientists that when Greenland was green and uh, uh, during that time period when the Vikings lived there with, with hundreds if not thousands of people in Greenland and Iceland, that uh, indeed that was a very wonderful time for the Earth, that uh, crops flourished. Uh, when it was higher degrees of temperature uh, back in a thousand years ago, crops flourished, uh, populations expanded, and it was a time when civilization was greatly benefited. Uh, with that said, temperature rise in and of itself then is not a problem, uh, or not a problem we could deal with just as the temperature rise on Mars and the other planets that we're going through right now is not a problem, and which is probably due to uh, sunspots. Now, with that said, let me note that that does not mean that those of us who uh, challenge the scientific integrity of the arguments that you are presenting to us today have a disagreement uh, with that we need to do things aimed at energy and cleaning the air. Uh, I am totally committed uh, to energy independence for this country for a number of reasons, uh, and which we all know. We are now vulnerable to foreign potentates and terrorist states, uh, which would do us harm. We are actually pumping money into the hands of our uh, people who hate our way of life. We don't need to do that. We should be developing energy resources, and those energy resources should be clean, not because the air uh, is any warmer or less warm than it was 200 years ago on the Earth, but because I have, uh, like Mr. Lantos, I have three, I have three little kids that I want to have clean air and I want them to be healthy. And uh, to the degree, and I guess the question that I would like to throw out is, uh, is there not a parallel direction here that if we don't get focused on just certain, uh, for example, just CO2, isn't there a, uh, um, a parallel course for those of us who are interested in human health uh, that, uh, that draws us together in, in a policy that may be parallel in terms of cleaning the air and creating energy independence uh, and that the global warming thing may not have to be, we may not necessarily have to be in agreement on that particular, uh, how do you say, motive behind those changes. Go for it. 
speechless. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if y'all could well, be as brief as possible. <laughs> <laughs> very, uh, I'll be very brief, uh, Representative Rohrbacher. I um, clearly um, beg to disagree on the science, but let's not have that debate here. Um, but I, I uh, looked at it carefully, and uh, there are uncertainties in the impacts, there are uncertainties in the amount of warming, but the thrust of the direction is, is, is pretty clear and compelling and real. And I, uh, as a former uh, um, astrophysicist, I would assure you that sunspots are a, a tiny little perturbation on this problem. So just to put that on the side. But the second point is, yes, we, we, we should agree on a direction to take the country forward on clean energy. Uh, it's, it's vital to creating new industries for, this, for the century we live in. Uh, clearly, our largest companies uh, see that this is the direction of the future that makes them more competitive in the international arena, and we can have clean air and clean water and uh, live a, a lifestyle that uh, encourages all of us to live better. So I, I hope that we will all agree on the, the clean energy dimension of all of this, but I beg to disagree on the science. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I, I think there are two things that um, are, or two policy areas that um, pretty much any point of view on climate change would indicate are, are worthwhile. One of them is the, just a massive additional commitment to energy R&D, and to, especially to break through R&D, which is far enough back in the chain that you're not really sure whether it's going to help with energy independence or help with global climate. We just know that it's going to make a lot of energy technologies work a lot better. The second thing, I think, really is an emphasis on institutional reform in developing countries. China, much, uh, my research suggests that much of the reason for China's very dirty economic growth is its lack of the fundamental market institutions, the rule of law, the protection of intellectual property, the things that bring about technology transfer and efficient markets. If we concentrate on bringing those changes about in the rest of the world, they're going to be good for economic growth. We don't need, it doesn't matter how high a priority we put on climate change to make those things important in those countries. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry that I <coughs> missed uh, your testimony, but I just wonder, it's a simplistic question, um, if um, uh, the current trends uh, continue, um, you know, Mr. Robacher feels that perhaps it's not as, uh, as, as bad as, as scientists say it is. Uh, however, could you, any of you or each of you, uh, give me some examples of of the worst case scenarios, um, it, what would happen to the polar caps, what would happen to um, uh, coral reefs, what would happen to, to maybe islands uh, in, uh, out in the Pacific, what happens to, to um, our coastlands uh, on the east coast of, uh, say, of the U.S. or even the, uh, the west coast. Uh, could someone just try to give me a a worse, really a worst case scenario because I'm one that do believe that uh, this thing is a little more serious than some of our colleagues feel it is. Um, if, if I could, um, I, I think, let me just sort of run down a list of some of the possibilities. I mean, even if the polar caps don't melt entirely, we are talking about substantial uh, sea level rise, which will affect parts of the United States, particularly around the Gulf. Um, but also it, essentially up and down the coasts, more in the southern part than in the northern part. Um, that's a global issue because there are many low-lying countries, um, and that in itself could cause migration and other national security issues. Um, we believe there will be both more droughts in some areas um, and more storms in others, um, both of which are very costly to deal with um, and potentially devastating. Um, we think there could be human health concerns from increases in the temperature. So, I mean, there are, there's no question that there will be loss of biodiversity. Uh, some species can uh, move north to accommodate. Some can accommodate where they are. Others will not be able to. So we will likely see loss of biodiversity as well. Um, so we believe this is a really serious problem and one of the reasons why we need to act, and we need to act with some urgency. Um. Just to, to support what Ms. Clausen has said, and which uh, is, has also been put out by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in their second report in, uh, in April, where they looked at 
the effects of various amounts of climate change uh, on all of the countries of the world. And um, certainly the, the, the report of the generals and admirals drew very heavily on that in terms of their worst case scenarios, in terms of massive drought, sea level rise, uh, f frequency, increased frequency of four and five category hurricanes or the equivalent with typhoons, that this was uh, very much in the cards. Uh, and this isn't even talking about the absolute worst case, which is the complete melting of the polar ice caps and the, the, the stopping of the Gulf Stream and all of those extreme cases. Uh, the Pentagon has commissioned some analysis on this because they, it, there's beginning to be a realization among our military community that this represents the mother of all security problems and that we are not equipped to deal with refugees in the hundreds of millions, um, uh, whether in Africa or in Asia or anything like that. So this has now become top of the agenda for our military planning. By the way, I just want to I don't want to sound as though I'm a doomsday uh, advocate or a scaremonger here because I don't want to make that clear. I don't want to make that impression. But we did spend 50 years in the Cold War looking at potentially catastrophic events that at the time we thought had low probability. The probability varied at time, from time to time, like the Berlin airlift had got harder or higher. Uh, in, but, but the point is that we spent a lot of money, uh, probably in today's terms, trillions of dollars in dealing with phenomena that could have potentially worst case or catastrophic consequences, but where the probabilities were small. So I think uh, I don't want to draw the analogy too closely, but as a, as, a, as, as a group of policy folks, we feel that we need to think long term and to start acting immediately to ward off uh, the worst case or even the bad cases that we've heard. <coughs> I think I just want to add, and I think Dr. Gerard is, is, is saying something like this, that there is an immense amount of uncertainty about all of this. Um, there's a small chance that all of this is going to go away and nothing bad is going to happen. There is a small chance of catastrophic consequences in our lifetime. I think most of the scientific opinion is it's most likely something in between is going to happen. That's why I think about it as risk management rather than a, you know, a very specific worst case that we, we, we know is going to we can avoid. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congressman Bill Arrakis. I think it's working, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yesterday, this is for the whole panel. Yesterday, the New York Times reported that the CIA Director uh, McConnell agrees that the CIA ought to be in the business of producing a national intelligence estimate on the effects of global warming on our national security. Last week, as you know, the House passed the Intelligence Authorization Bill, which included the funding for intelligence uh, agencies to conduct global warming, uh, impacting uh, an impact study. My question is, do you believe that our intelligence agencies are equipped to conduct such studies? And do you believe that global warming is a more imminent threat than terrorism? Um, uh, let me t take a, a, a quick try at that. Um, do I think our intelligence agencies are equipped? Um, I, I think if, if they are not, um, and I probably have some questions about whether they are at the moment, um, I think it is very important that they become equipped um, because I think it is an issue that they need to be able to deal with, um, and I think that could be done. Um, you asked about whether it's a greater threat than terrorism, and um, you know, I, I think there are many threats, and we just have to learn how to deal with them all. So. Yes, I, I certainly agree that, uh, and this is happening already, that, 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 our, that the Pentagon and our intelligence communities have to uh, become very serious about this issue. Uh, I think that there's been a clarion call from top leaders that, that this could be a set of security issues that confronts us around the world that we are not prepared to deal with. Uh, in conventional terms, and that I, I hope that they will acquire the capacity to deal with these issues in a comprehensive way, and which really represents uh, a new attitude towards forward engagement. We've thought about forward engagement as a military strategy. Now we should think about forward engagement in terms of, uh, of unanticipated and, and, and perhaps uh, d dire consequences. So yes, I think, and, I, and again, that we have many threats. I'd hate yeah. to have a comparative analysis of which is worse. Um, certainly wouldn't want to go there, but I certainly want to say that we need to acquire the capacity to deal with this set of threats. They're interconnected, they're on many different timescales, they're on many different nations, 
And I think this is a whole new set of threats that we need to uh, have a kind of forward engagement capacity to deal with uh, in our intelligence community. Well, I think there is something we finally disagree on. Uh, this, uh, this is uh, a, an ish a, a topic that actually was part of what I did when I was uh, with the U.S. government. I chaired an interagency group dealing with the analysis of energy security issues and all supply disruptions, worked fairly closely with the intelligence community in doing that. And I would say, first, I am somewhat attracted to the notion of a national intelligence estimate looking at the um, effects of global warming and national security because there has been so much utter nonsense said about the subject that I think it might be a good idea to have a, uh, uh, a dispassionate and objective view taken, and I think the, the CIA and the intelligence community are, are capable of, uh, of that kind of independence. Having said that, I think it's, a, I think it's absurd to say that global warming can pose anywhere near as clear and present a danger to the United States as terrorism. We're simply talking about different time scales. And I am concerned, given that it's not just a matter of money in the intelligence community. I have an immense respect for the people I worked with there who dealt with international energy issues. They really knew their business, but there were very few of them, and they were heavily tasked with many things. And it takes a long time to develop people in an agency, and I don't know whether it would be a good idea to have the people there uh, with, their lim you know, with their limited capacity, you know, capability of the uh, uh, number of hours in the day divert their attention to this. Um, it's not a matter of we should be putting lots of money into, the, into intelligence. We should, but I'm not sure we have enough people there right now with the expertise to do this. It would be a good idea to divert them from what I think are, are in fact, by any reasonable time scale, more pressing dangers. Thank you. I have one more uh, question, Mr. Chairman, or do we have time? I can ask them afterward. Uh, 30 seconds. Okay, I'll ask you afterwards. Thank you. Both those of us from Texas and Florida have a hard time getting a question in 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> Congresswoman Sanchez. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this question is for all of the panelists. Um, there's actually two. I'll ask them, and then if you could please respond. Um, the Bush administration's failure to rejoin participation in the Kyoto Protocol and its rejection of mandatory self-imposed limitations of greenhouse gas emissions has created quite a dilemma when it asks developing countries to implement rigorous efforts to reduce greenhouse gases. So the two questions that I have are, first, are there any alternatives to rejoining the Kyoto Protocol that will pacify what I think is correct international criticism? And the second question is, would a serious U.S. commitment to climate change improvements persuade other developing countries who have not ratified the Kyoto Protocol to engage in these discussions? Um, if I may uh, begin, um, I think the issue is no longer joining the Kyoto Protocol um, because the budget period ends in 2012 and I think most of the world is looking at what succeeds Kyoto and what kind of an agreement we can forge um, for the period after 2012. Um, so I think th the most important thing for the United States is to be very active in trying to work through a framework that goes beyond 2012 and actually has a chance of solving the problem. Um, I think there are two things the U.S. really needs to do. The first is to take some action to deal with our own emissions because I believe that is the only way we will have the credibility um, to, one, be a leader abroad, and two, to persuade the major developing countries, because I think they have to be a part of anything that, that comes next to, to do something to limit their own emissions. Very quickly, I think that um, what the message that resonates with uh, industry leaders in, in India and China is the fact that, um, that, that, policies, that, that mandatory policies to, to cut carbon can be a spur for technological innovation uh, that will make their industries uh, more competitive, not less competitive, and can provide what are so-called co-benefits, can also help local air pollution and local water pollution. The, uh, the president of, of India called recently for meeting India's uh, um, power requirements in 2030, 25% of it with, with renewables, which is an immense, it's like 100,000 megawatts of power. Uh, in order to get there, uh, it's clear that many of the industry leaders are promoting policies that, uh, 
will begin to encourage uh, a path that will give carbon a value. And so this coalition that we've seen in the United States of, uh, of large industries and um, non-governmental policy research groups uh, is getting some traction abroad uh, because they see that this coalition can uh, actively act to promote policies that will lead to technological innovation. And I think, I think that when one talks about technology and investment, you really get heard in India and China. And if this is seen as a way to, to accelerate uh, economic growth, especially for the poorest, while at the same time cutting emissions, um, I think that's the way to go and that's the dialogue. But we will not be credible in that conversation unless we've done it ourselves. And that's, that's the problem we have is that we find ourselves either demonizing these countries like India and China or lecturing them, but we don't say, well, we've done it and it works. And we'd like to be in a position to say that. Okay. I think okay, that point. we all ac actually agree that the United States needs to re-engage in developing an alternative framework for a long term uh, for long term action internationally. We may not exactly agree what that framework should conclude, but we all think there needs to be a new one. Um, as far as developing countries go, we hear frequently the developing countries saying, you go first. I've never heard them say, we will follow. And saying, you go first is not the same as saying, I will follow. As I've indicated in my prepared testimony, I think that moving too far ahead uh, creates competitive advantages for those countries in staying outside the agreement and continuing to concentrate on energy intensive industries, and we don't want to create too much of that. I think engaging them on technology transfer, which is something they really want, is the area that we can begin to make some progress, um, and I think maybe we have some consensus on that. Follow-up question for you, Dr. Montgomery, but do we not lose credibility if we say you must do this, but we are not doing it? I mean, I can understand yeah. the you go first and I will follow, yeah. but, it, but it's sort of almost patronizing to say you must do this, although I'm exempt because do as I say, not as, as I do. Does that not lose U.S. credibility I around think, the world? I think the U.S. needs to be very articulate, very clear on articulating what we are doing and why. If the U.S. adopts a set of emission caps, if you, do, you know, passed any of the legislation that we are seeing in the current Congress, uh, that is certainly something the U.S. could point to. If instead the U.S. were to focus on um, a massive R&D program, um, that's something we could point to. I think the engagement with developing countries has, has I think something that we have probably not made clear enough in our discussion with developing countries is uh, we actually do s that there are, in fact, immense opportunities for clean development in those countries that would probably be good for their economies. And that if we work for the, them on those reasons, it's not, and that that's where we need to focus. You're absolutely right, saying that we think China should devote 10 percent, should give up 10 percent of its GDP in order to reduce its emissions, and we're not willing to give up 1 percent of GDP to reduce ours. That's not going to convince anybody. If we say we're willing, we're taking actions here that we think are going to be effective in the long run, and we want to work with you on doing things that will not only reduce your emissions but be good for your economy, that's a different kind of engagement. I agree with you. The United States cannot get developing countries into something like the Kyoto Protocol without, because we're asking them to undertake big sacrifices without us asking for big sacrifices. If we can develop that alternative framework that looks for win-win solutions, then that's not the choice anymore. Thank you. I yield back. Congressman Smith. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, just let me say for the record that I have long been concerned about global warming and as early as 1989 sponsored an amendment to the Foreign Relations Authorization Act for 1990 and 1991 that was adopted that would have required the Secretary of State to study the feasibility of establishing a global warming prevention information network. This network would have been tasked with disseminating prompt, accurate, and comprehensive information concerning matters pertaining to global warming to foreign governments, business organizations, the public, and private institutions and citizens of other countries. The amendment, like I said, was approved. Unfortunately, the bill itself was vetoed. In 1990, I also proposed legislation to establish an office of global change information that would disseminate information uh, available in the U.S. that would be useful in identifying, preventing, and mitigating or adapting the effects of global warming uh, to various entities around the world. Uh, so when I look at Section 103 of Chairman Lantos's bill, I'm very encouraged that, that there, there are some real similarities, and I think, um, you know, this discussion draft 
uh, which probably will be introduced soon, uh, takes us, I think, uh, to a newer level, and I think it's, uh, uh, I'm looking at it very carefully, and I'm glad the chairman has um, uh, disseminated that to the members. I do have two questions I'd like to ask our very distinguished panel. Uh, Senator Sam Nunn testified last week and made the point that, I quote, energy demands will grow by 50 percent in the next 20 years, even more in developing countries. And he pointed out that as energy needs rise, as the pace of global warming increases, nations will look more and more to nuclear power. And I'm wondering if the panel could address the issue of how concerned you are that major incentives to go nuclear are perhaps unwittingly being unleashed as we attempt to address the very real and compelling danger of global warming. Uh, as uh, we know, there are about 435 nuclear power plants in existence today. About a fourth of those are found in the United States. There are 28 globally under construction and about 200 more uh, that are planned. Nuclear power has its own set of dire environmental dangers, not to mention the fear, and I am very, very concerned about this, and I think everyone is, uh, about dirty bombs, as well as the proliferation issue of nuclear weapons. The more fissile material we have out there, uh, the more capability or the more potential there is for the making of bombs. And then there's that big, terrible, uh, dismaying issue of nuclear waste, uh, seemingly unresolvable. Uh, as we know, we're storing uh, this, this very dangerous waste on site. We have two nuclear plants in the state of New Jersey. I've been to them. Uh, I look at these heavy uh, casts filled with nuclear material, and I wonder, what if? Um, you know, somebody uh, thinks that they could turn this into a dirty bomb, and then if Yucca Mountain ever does receive uh, its, its um, uh, anticipated uh, waste, uh, it would be filled within a couple of years, and then what do we do then going on into the future? So nuclear waste is a serious, serious environmental risk as well as a, a risk to human life and to animal and all ecosystems. So I'm wondering what your feeling is that we are perhaps incentivizing. Uh, I, we have to address global warming, but we have to be so careful that we don't unwittingly unleash the second problem, uh, which would be a exponential increase in nuclear power. Um, the, um, as you quite rightly said, um, this is being promoted as an, a carbon-free option. Uh, the issues you described are very real, which is that in, and one has to put in perspective, if one were to triple the number of nuclear plants in, in the world to say more like about 1,500, uh, this would be uh, only about one-fifth or one-sixth of the increase in carbon emissions uh, between now and 2050. So that even a tripling of the nuclear power capacity of the world is a very modest contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. Having said that, the, um, perhaps the most authoritative look at the future of nuclear power, uh, which involved people on all sides of this question, um, which was the MIT report issued about four years ago, pointed out exactly the issues you raised, which is that uh, in, in order for this to be a, uh, an option that is scalable, we would have to deal with proliferation. Uh, they recommended a once-through fuel cycle so that you wouldn't have plutonium coursing through the world, and that, that they would have to be, they would have to make economic sense. Uh, at the moment, at least in the U.S. context, uh, it's not going to work in with, um, unless one has, uh, you know, pretty giant subsidies uh, for, for plants. And uh, the, the MIT group proposed a production tax credit so that they would only get these subsidies if they actually produced a plant that produced kilowatt hours. But, Currently, the, so there, there are economic competitiveness issues, there are waste disposal issues, there are certainly proliferation issues. Um, we don't take a position on nuclear power at our institute, but uh, privately, it, it shouldn't be taken completely off the agenda when global warming is such an important problem, but we should be cognizant of the risks, uh, the political risks and the ec economics. And I'd like to see those decisions being made uh, in a way that meets both the safety concerns of citizens. I think public acceptance is going to be a big issue. Uh, and that make economic sense so that we are not subsidizing. Um, as I said a little while ago, it's you know, subsidizing nuclear plants like subsidizing Donald Trump to build another tower. Um, <laughs> so um, we shouldn't be subsidizing this technology. It's, an, it's, a, it's a mature technology. Um, but that doesn't mean we should, we have 435 nuclear plants operating and we're going to have to manage them and to manage the waste from them. So uh, we, should, we should keep that option, um, but we should approach it very, very cautiously. 
Yes. I think. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have a somewhat different point of view. I think that just about every analysis that I look at of how we can achieve stabilization of global temperatures suggests or you know, concludes that um, contributions have to come from a variety of sources. Nothing is going to provide 100 percent. That, in fact, the contribution of nuclear power that Dr. Girard uh, just described would want to be one of the largest wedges in contributing to uh, stabilization of greenhouse gas emissions. There are only a couple of energy sources that we can even think of that have zero carbon emissions that can be deployed on a scale that's not inherently limited. I can think of two of them, carbon capture and sequestration and nuclear power. If we take one of those off the table, nuclear power, um, I think that it makes it immensely more difficult and expensive to try to achieve any climate goals. And I would suggest that all the difficulties that you're discussing are ones that we have to face anyway. Whether we have a growing nuclear industry or not, they all need solutions. And the solutions, uh, and, and, and again, it's why in this case, as many others, we need to start think, finding ways to do the technology better, which may involve backing up and starting over again to find ways of doing some of the things that the MIT study did making it again a problem of we need to put the R&D money in order to get it right. Um, but I, I, I think the, um, the trade-off is one of an immensely more difficult task of, uh, of, of meeting long-term stabilization goals without nuclear power. Thank you. Congressman Costa. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. A um, couple questions. and. Um, I don't know if all three of you want to comment on it or not. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Gerard, you had mentioned in response to a question that was earlier asked to you, um, and to paraphrase you, that if we could ever get a comprehensive energy policy, uh, that that would be appropriate as we would follow through. And I, I'm paraphrasing you, of course. But I think when you made that statement, um, you asked at least, a, or you responded to a question that I continue to have. And that is, notwithstanding all the various efforts since 1973 when we had the first gas lines, there have been numerous efforts by every president, I believe, um, and Congresses to try to put together um, a comprehensive energy policy and with a lot of fanfare. And of course, we know we import more energy today than we did almost twice as much as we did in 1973. What would the three of you define as the key components to what is real and what is not real, both in the interim and the long term, in advising members of Congress with the impacts of global warming, what a comprehensive energy policy should, in fact, contain? And my second question is, is uh, uh, what any of you believe the merits of cap and trade are and what we ought to be doing to implement a cap and trade policy? Uh, maybe I can go first. Um, I, I think the most important thing in an energy policy is that we have a diverse portfolio of supply options. Um, a lot of our electricity comes from coal. Um, it's cheap, it's available from an energy security point of view. Um, it's important. Um, I think we just have to find ways to burn coal uh, that doesn't harm the climate. Um, nuclear provides about 20 percent of our electricity. Um, I don't think we can deal with climate change successfully unless uh, nuclear remains a part of that portfolio. Renewable energy at the moment is a very, very small uh, portion um, of where our energy comes from. Um, I think that can be vastly increased. Um, and I think the state actions to deal with renewables, I think there are 23 states that have renewable portfolio standards. I think that kind of thing on a national scale would make a huge difference and would be very beneficial. Um, but I think the most important thing is that now, unlike in the past, there are two really strong drivers um, for a comprehensive energy policy, energy security and climate change. Um, there are many cases where they work together synergistically. 
Um, and I think that has to be the way we move forward. Um, and I think it's a unique opportunity that we actually haven't had before. I agree it's a unique opportunity, but I think what's lacking is, is some consensus on what should be contained in that definitive list, taking a snapshot on what our current use is uh, with some sort of logic as to over the next five, ten years what our future use will be and where we're going to draw the existing. I mean, we, we, we seem to be lacking that ability to do that. I, uh, I, I agree with, uh, with what was just said, which is that we, we, we need uh, both a policy for the electricity sector and a policy for oil and transport. Most of our security problems don't have to do with the electricity sector. They have to do with liquid fuels and oil. I think the electricity problems, clearly we need to keep uh, nuclear on the table uh, if we're to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We need to have carbon sequestration. But I would say perhaps one of the most important things we haven't done, and because it's tough to do politically, is to price, uh, to price oil correctly. The domestic. Thomas Friedman concept, yeah. put yeah. a tax on it and pay for everything that we need to do. Uh, and rather than subsidizing ethanol from corn, and rather than subsidizing X, <laughs> Y, and Z, just give fossil fuel, you know, at a dollar plus a gallon, uh, or whatever, and, and a lot of, that will stimulate the market for a lot of technology. So instead of having special interest Subsidies, we might consider just a blanket uh, price. Buy the that, bullet uh, and go for I'm it. I'm not an economist, but my economist <laughs> friends tell me that this is. You're obviously story. not a politician either. <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm, <laughs> and I'm not a politician either. <laughs> but I thought it might be refreshing to say the thing that's the third rail no, in American I, politics. No, I think it has merit. <laughs> okay. Quickly, Dr. Montgomery, because um, I, I like what time. I'm hearing. I think it's important to get the government role in R and D right. And I think for the rest of our problems, we need to have direct performance-oriented policies that attack the problems rather than try to create complicated government solutions for them. And putting a price on the things that um, we need to deal with is a really good way of doing that that keeps it simple. Cap and trade quickly. Oh, my time's up. Cornerstone of a U.S. policy. Uh, I would endorse cap and trade heartily. Done right. <clears throat> There's more than one way to put a price on even CO2 emissions, and I think looking at cap, cap and trade is one, a carbon tax is another, um, a safety valve is a compromise between the two. I think they all ought to be looked at because the cap and trade system may not be the best one. Thank you very much, panel, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've ex my time's expired. Congressman McCall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we can all agree the climate is changing, it is getting warmer. I think the, the real issue that we have to grasp or deal with as policymakers is uh, what is causing that. We do know, at least the scientists I've talked to, that water vapor causes about 95 percent of the greenhouse gases. Um, so we're talking about the human element, which is um, less than 5 percent. We know that some of the ice caps, polar caps on other planets are starting to recede, which uh, in our solar system where there is no human activity. So there seems to be a natural phenomena occurring. And then the, the question is, what do we do uh, to deal with, with the, the warming change in, in the um, environment? Uh, it, it, se it seems to me that uh, the Kyoto Treaty without China and India is not uh, a very good option, because those are the two, uh, and in addition to the United States, the, the two biggest offenders. Uh, they have 160 coal plants ready to fire up in, in China. Um, how do we engage them is my first question. The second one has to do with R&D investment. I think that, uh, you know, the University of Texas in my district is dealing with the carbon capture and sequestration issue very well. It's, it's a very exciting area uh, in terms of energy policy. But what, uh, again, I don't think being punitive towards business and then they're for impacting our ability to globally compete uh, is a good idea from the United States standpoint. What, what do we need to invest in from an R&D technology standpoint that would best uh, protect the environment and at the same time get us on a energy policy that's, that's not dependent on foreign oil? And then finally, the nuclear and solar, nuclear power and solar. Um, you know, applied materials in my district is working, they're working intensely on solar. Energy, there's plenty of it, and it's going to last for a long time. Uh, the nuclear option has been put on the table in this country for three decades, and it's gone nowhere. And yet it's, it's essentially, other than dealing with the, the waste that you get, it's, it does not emit the, uh, the carbons that we have to deal with. 
it seems to me France is 80 percent nuclear power. We'll be looking at that uh, issue as well. I'll turn it over. Um, I'll try to be very brief. Um, what can the U.S. do to engage uh, the other big emitting countries? Uh, two things, do something nationally ourselves so that we actually have some credibility, and two, find a flexible enough framework so that others will find reason uh, to move forward. And I think incentives for clean energy are the way to proceed because a lot of those countries are going to have huge demand for energy. We have to find ways for them to limit their emissions as they continue to grow. Um, you, you talked about coal and carbon sequestration. I agree. Um, a lot of our electricity comes from coal. Uh, Eighty percent of China's comes from coal. Um, if we're going to deal with global warming, we have to be able to deal with the burning of coal. Um, and I, too, am very encouraged by the possibilities for carbon capture and sequestration. We have more work to do to demonstrate that the technology works, and then we probably need a policy to make sure that people do it. Um, nuclear and solar, I mean, I think everything has got to be a part of the energy portfolio. Uh, I think nuclear has to be, I think there is lots of promise in solar, just as there is with wind. And in your state, there's actually a huge amount of wind, um, which I think has been very beneficial from an economic point of view as well. Again, to be brief, I, I think we need to, to greatly expand our R&D capacity and a whole portfolio of technologies. There's no s a single magic solution here. Uh, I think that uh, we also need to invest in, in how we can take our innovations and bring them into the marketplace more successfully. We are often very good at innovating and then finding that other uh, countries uh, would get the market benefit. I think this, this can change. There are ways to do this. But very specifically, I think that uh, clearly, we need to uh, have uh, advanced uh, coal combustion solutions with carbon capture and storage. That's an absolute essential uh, part of our R&D. That's a, an area we can collaborate with the Indias and Chinas of this world. I do think that there are potentially very interesting breakthroughs in, in thin film technology on the solar side that have the potential for cost reductions. We are seeing advances in uh, battery technology with uh, much higher battery storage, much higher uh, capacity to store electricity, which will be essential in bringing, not just for transport, uh, for, for automobiles, but also bringing uh, more renewables and wind into the power grid. We, we need to, to advance to have a more intelligent grid, the so-called smart grid, uh, where we can, uh, which operates more like an energy internet rather than a one-way flow. I think we can, uh, that will do, a, that uses our strengths in information technology and in networks and in materials technology. So there's a lot of work to be done in moving our uh, grid into the 21st century and being able to accommodate a, a vast variety of, of uh, wind and renewable energies and solar. But I think that it would be nice to uh, see that uh, our R&D also uh, works with the private sector to, cost, uh, to, to share costs and risks so that there's a, not a long lead time between the R&D effort and bringing this into the commercial arena. So it's a diverse portfolio. And it's an opportunity to unleash uh, a lot of American innovation and, um, and capture, uh, I think, a, a much cleaner energy system and a much more efficient power grid. Thank you. I'd say get the private sector involved. In the R&D end, we do need a much larger um, commitment by the federal government to R&D. I would say that the focus of that should be in the R&D end and on developing the breakthrough technologies. Um, don't waste the money on huge demonstration projects of current technology that aren't going to take us into the future. Leave it to the private sector to take that up when the, te when the technology is ready. And the same thing on developing countries. I think the engagement has to involve the private sector very heavily because what China and India need in order to produce, improve their carbon intensity is technology transfer, which usually comes about through foreign direct investment, which means that the engagement has to be doing things to improve their investment climate and make their markets work efficiently in order to get the private sector to, to, to do what it does well, which is use energy and all resources efficiently and bring the new technologies in that can bring their carbon intensity down to ours, I think, very rapidly. I, th I thank the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congresswoman Jackson Lee. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for uh, hosting uh, this hearing. Uh, members are in a, a number of hearings, and uh, uh, this sort of had a red light on my calendar, and I wanted to make sure that I had the opportunity to be here. I want to take a moment just to sort of uh, peruse uh, where we are. 
uh, and the partners that have to be engaged uh, in this process of global climate change and also changing our attitudes. The most popular, obviously, signal on changing attitudes is uh, when you visit with school children and they tell you, um, I want you to know that the gas prices are too high. I imagine as they're being carpooled, somebody behind the wheel uh, is complaining about gasoline prices, and I'm interested in gasoline prices. So uh, that's how climate change uh, impacts um, sometimes your constituents, and they're not looking at uh, the whole global issue. And that brings me to the question of who our partners are and what are we thinking and when we begin to craft not only a message but a mission. Um, obviously, the International Kyoto Agreement is not something that um, we found bipartisanship in. I happen to have been an enthusiastic supporter, but I know now that it, it has aged, uh, and it's age and aging, and so it may, may not even be the current uh, format. I don't know. I'm very interested in this uh, theory of cap and trade as it relates to emissions, and I think it is a thoughtful process. But I'm concerned because um, there are many of our communities uh, where the energy industry uh, is an engine of the economy. Uh, it's a culture, and certainly the Gulf region, uh, that is our culture. Uh, Houston is proud. My colleague comes from Houston. He serves Avely on energy commerce. He knows his work has been uh, to uh, proudly try to, to balance and to represent that engine of the economy. Uh, we're concerned if we have um, losing the battle on, on educating geologists um, so that uh, these uh, skills are not lost. Uh, we know what happened during Katrina when the whole industry was shut down, uh, and we wanted to find a way not only to restore it, but to make sure it came back, uh, what is it, ecologically uh, and environmentally sure and safe. So if I could ask um, the witnesses uh, as they uh, incorporate the concept of what they think of cap and trade, but who are our partners? I am concerned that as we speak, um, our major energy companies are continuing to load up and profit but really think that we're enemies when we begin to talk about the global climate change. And they have many friends here. I happen to come from Houston. Uh, my colleagues come from, from Houston in the Gulf region. Uh, we want to have a package that works. So can you um, just take that broad base? Uh, how do we get our energy barons to be partners? Uh, and what do you think of this message of cap and trade and this whole idea of our partnerships and who are they? Um, maybe I can be uh, very brief. Um, at the Pew Center, we work with 43 companies, including lots of energy companies. Good. Um, <laughs> and um, I think we agree as a group that cap and trade is the most rational approach to dealing with this problem. Um, I can also say that we are a founding member of the U.S. Climate Action Partnership, uh, which is now 26 um, organizations, of, of which uh, six are NGOs, so 20 our companies, and um, I think you will find that there are oil companies and energy companies that are a part of that as well, and not only do they support cap and trade, but they have a very specific proposal for what the targets and timetables should be. Um, so I think you would be surprised to learn that there's actually a huge interest in the private sector in cap and trade, um, and there are many, many supporters there. Doctor, not seeing the... Well, I didn't want to sound repetitive, but my organization is also involved with these 20-plus um, companies, and we work uh, a lot with a large number of others who are not part of the U.S. Climate Action Partnership, but who, uh, who have begun to factor in cap and trade as, as part of their corporate strategy. Um, it's clear to me that there are energy companies involved. There's, uh, there's Duke Power, there's General Electric on the power side, but also on the hydrocarbon side, there's... Uh, BP and, and Chevron Texaco have uh, joined the U.S. Climate Action Partnership and actively supported a phased program. Hmm? Conoco yeah, and, oh, sorry, and ConocoPhillips. Like, please yeah. strike that. Okay. ConocoPhillips, not oh. Chevron Texaco. Um, I was just, I just had dinner with uh, someone from right. Chevron Texaco last night. We want the <laughs> record to be clear, but I, the more that you mention, the happy I'm going to be. But, yeah. but, but, but anyway, the, the, the point is that they actively embrace uh, a thoughtful, careful, phased uh, a program of cap and trade that avoids uh, some of the errors that are quite possible. And they can be an effective partner, or they, you and believe they can be they are a, a very effective partner effort. for us and, and for the Congress. Mr. Uh, Dr. Montgomery? Um, I'm not going to speak for industries, but for the results of some of our analysis, which suggests that a comprehensive 
and uniform approach to climate policy, whether it be a cap and trade system or a uniform carbon tax across the whole economy, produces results that I think are much more um, palatable to industry, if they think about it carefully, than the results of regulatory interventions, interventions, subsidy programs, and mandates. For example, when we analyze the consequences for the next 20 years of a uniform cap and trade system, we see relatively small impacts on the petroleum sector. That's because cost-effective changes in transportation technology and motor vehicles take a very long time, and petroleum is, in fact, a very efficient fuel for powering our transportation system. So I think that um, that is, that's just something to keep in mind, that um, a, a taking a dispassionate view of how a, you know, a cap-and-trade system might work uh, sometimes produces some surprises about what the impacts on industry are going to be. I think also that, um, again, going back to the notion of developing the technologies in R&D, I think that most of the energy industries, and certainly the people I talk to in the oil and gas industry, are very concerned about our technology base, about the availability of the engineers and scientists to create the technologies we need, um, my son's a geophysicist, though he lives in Denver, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. And so I think about that area, too, as being something where I think there's, there's a great deal of uh, potential consensus on what can be done. But the main point would be, if you look at something like the Sanders-Boxer bill, the Sanders-Boxer bill has, in addition to a cap-and-trade system, some very specific regulatory requirements for fuel economy standards and other provisions. They may actually turn out to have much bigger impacts on industry than you would see with a plain vanilla cap and trade or, or carbon tax approach. I thank you. Mr. Chairman, I just want to make this closing remark. I hope that uh, we will also include in the partnership uh, some of the, the particularly unique, I call them peculiar institutions, uh, historically black colleges, Hispanic serving colleges, institutions that are in inner city areas. Uh, many of them are broaching or trying to reach out to solar energy, alternative research, even in these institutions, and they are good messengers for communities that are negatively impacted by either high gas prices, air pollution, and other uh, indicia that have to do with climate change. Thank you. Uh, I yield back. Thank you. The chair recognizes Congressman Zuno. Thank you, Chairman. I, I just have a couple of observations. First of all, I think we spend a lot of unnecessary time and energy trying to trying to center the the argument in terms of global warming as opposed to global pollution. Everybody agrees there's global pollution, but not everybody agrees that global pollution leads to global warming. And so the 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 emphasis should be based should be based upon what do we do to try to to lessen global pollution and let people make their own determination as to the impact of that, of that pollution. You take a look at, a, at rivers, and it's obvious when there's a watermelon rind going down uh, that it's unsightly and somewhere down the line it's going, it's going to harm somebody. The second thing is, is Dr. Jerry, can, can I ask you a personal question? Well, what kind of car do you drive? What well, you know, kind of automobile do you drive? Uh, I drive a, a Toyota Corolla. Could, could you? Sorry, I, I drive a Toyota Corolla. You don't have an SUV in your garage? No. no okay. No. And how far do you live from work? I live about 10 miles from work, and okay. I drive to work every day. All right. Mm -hmm. Let me give you a situation that I really want you to, uh, to take into consideration. I think it's really, I want to find the correct words because I, 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 you're a guest here and everything. I have a rural area. My constituents drive to work not just for the hell of it because they have to. And for the theorists out there and the philosophers to say, all we have to do is just increase the tax on gasoline and people will drive less, don't use that in my congressional district. That insults 700,000 people who must drive as a matter of, of necessity unless you want them all to move to the city. There are about 10 areas like Washington, D.C. There's so much pollution around here. There's so much congestion. But that's the only way that, that they're going to be near transport, public transportation in order to get to work. But for the people that live in Galena and Warren and Polo and Mount Morris and Forreston and who love the country way of life, who want to see their kids grow up in the country, who don't want to be anywhere near the big cities, 
who appreciate the fact that not everybody should live in a city, that automobile is like their legs. And to, and, and to have the people say, just tax gas more so we use less. I would suggest that people with that argument walk to work or take a bicycle to work because that doesn't bring any type of harmony or any, that doesn't add anything to the solution, at least for the people in my congressional district. I'm, I'm just giving you that in the for what it's worth department. Second of all, on the unilateral controls. Somebody at XM in 1990 really screwed up America's opportunity to sell hundreds of millions of dollars worth of equipment to the Three Gorges Dam project. And Senator Simon and I begged the administration at that time. What a stupid requirement to have an environmental uh, have an environmental sanction against companies that wanted to sell the Three Gorges Dam project when those companies who sold there were chosen from around the world, regardless of the impact that went on there. Caterpillar alone lost $300 million. And you can go over from company to company to company to company. And in the proposed legislation that we're going to mark up next week, at least somebody was through the words mandatory, it talks about OPIC and some more requirements that are necessary before we do it. Third thing is the employee commute option. Great idea back in 1990 with the 1990 uh, Clean Air Act forced people to use public transportation. Well, one of my counties, McHenry County, is right on top of Cook County. No public transportation, essentially a rural area. It's now, it's now grown up. The law was so stupid that school teachers were mandated to use to carpool in order to go to school, but students were not mandated. And perhaps the school teachers could sit there um, with their thumb out wanting to get a, a hitchhiker ride to school uh, while the students were exempt. We eventually um, uh, worked with uh, Congressman Waxman to change the law to have for the maximum flexibility. But when we have these mandates, such as taxing the gas or even the carbon trading system, I spend most of my time in Congress working on manufacturing issues. Well, one of the finest fastener manufacturers in Spain, in one of the most, in one of the cleanest uh, environmentally, is almost knocked out of business because Morocco is not covered by the carbon trading system. And they're bringing all the fasteners right across the Straits of Gibraltar uh, from Morocco over, over to Spain. And so when we do these things unilaterally, it doesn't really make that much difference. It helps, but it doesn't make that much difference. Now, I, you want to respond to that? That's fine. I, See, my time has run out, but it's up to the chair, whatever we want to do. At least, Dr. Chair, you should have the opportunity to defend yourself. <laughs> you could be very brief in your response. <laughs> and, it, and it wasn't personal. It was just a good opportunity to take a jab at a, although, at a system. Although, just a comment from the chair. I noticed you didn't mention that uh, subsidy for ethanol that, uh, that Illinois well, benefits from. even still, from. I mean, I, I raise beef cattle. You know, people say, oh, my gosh, the, uh, the, the cattle emissions in the atmosphere. I'd like to see somebody come up with a solution for that one. That was, we can sequestrate that methane. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have methane digesters, but we can't sell it to the grids. Mm -hmm. There's a problem there. Dr. Carrot, you've been, you've been great. Well, I, I certainly uh, appreciate your very blunt <clears throat> uh, discussion of, of, of your constituents and their dependence on driving to work, and I, I, uh, I think that is an issue for a lot of people. And so uh, I don't propose to... Uh, to sit in Washington and uh, and try to f find ways to make life harder. In fact, our approach is to make life easier for, for a whole group of people who don't live in the Beltway. But the, the, the point I was just going to make is that clearly, and, and this gets into uh, a lot of uh, policy analysis stuff, and I don't want to go, go into that in long details, but that clearly if one is going to tax something like carbon uh, or gasoline, that there have to be some measures to make it uh, uh, Make it a progressive so that it's not progressive to people under a certain income level who will, who will feel the pinch. And uh, I think that some of the analysis we've done show that you can't just do it by itself. You've got to have some measures to protect those who don't have the income or don't have the, uh, um, or who rely on their cars and rely on gasoline so that this doesn't affect them disproportionately. That's uh, 
So I, I, I think that's an issue, and I think it's an issue that we should deal with. Uh, I uh, noticed that, well, I, I'll, I'll stop right there because this is a long discussion. Maybe we should have it outside the, uh, outside the hearing room. I would room. love to. Thank you for your graciousness. <laughs> yes, Thank each of you. Well, Dr. Montgomery. I, I, if I could just in, in inject very quickly. Um, I think there is a question of whether something will be done about climate change. So let's assume that Congress does something. Then I think um, what your, rep your there are choices that are going to be made that are going to be better or worse for your constituents. I would suggest that your constituents are, would be a lot better off with a gasoline tax that at least allowed them to choose whether they were going to drive more because it does allow freedom of choice. They can choose to drive more, someone in the city can choose to drive less, as opposed to Congress deciding to impose a fuel economy standard that says they just flat can't buy a pickup truck that's big enough to pull anything worthwhile, or they have to carpool to go all those places that nobody else is going. So it's a question of the lesser of the evils there, and I would argue that there's a lot to be said for the tax approach being the lesser of those evils, even for someone in the position your constituents are Mr. in. Mr. Chairman, on this side. Yes. Yeah, let, if I can, just yield me a minute. Sure. In response to my, my good friend from Illinois and following up on your um, observation about ethanol, and I, I want to be clear, I'm not supporting a tax. I, I, I don't think that's the right way to go. Uh, however, I would presume that if we invested what we ought to invest in terms of R&D as far as cellulosic ethanol, for example, um, so that it became widespread, so that the market was, uh, well, for example, in Brazil, th there's not a car that's being produced today, it's my understanding, that isn't a flex fuel vehicle. Um, that we've done something about our energy security, and at the same time, while it's not a silver bullet in terms of diminishing the CO2 emissions, it, I hear, ranges from 20 or 30 percent in terms of a, dimin a dimin diminution. So it's a question of really how do we proceed. But I guess my question, because this is the Committee on Foreign Affairs, how do we take advantage of our foreign assistance as well as whether it's through OPIC, or the U.S. Trade Authority, or whatever, to incentivize particularly developing countries, and maybe we work in conjunction with the developed countries, whether it's the EU or, uh, or others, um, that would encourage them to, to do something significant or to accelerate their willingness to deal with CO2 emissions. Can, can I just respond uh, briefly here? I'd like to come into your office and talk about how we can deal with this problem in ways that work for you and your constituents. I'd be delighted. I, I, I'm thrilled, really, after the way I beat you guys up here. <laughs> Thank you. Any other comments? To no. Thank you again for being here, and committee's adjourned. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>